Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fourth uh, webinar here in our series uh, sponsored by the Georgia Climate Project. I hope everyone can see my screen. My name is Jill Gamble. I'm the Coastal Resilience Specialist and Public Service Associate uh, faculty member at the University of Georgia for uh, Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. And I'm also um, a team member of the leadership team for the Georgia Climate Project. Um, the Georgia Climate Project is a nine university statewide network uh, that was launched by Emory University, Georgia Tech, and University of Georgia several years ago to advance conversations and research around climate change in the state of Georgia. These are uh, our uh, affiliate uh, universities. We welcome additional um, participation. If anyone else would like to join, uh, please reach out to us. We'd like to thank our, our funders. Um, the Racy Anderson Foundation has been an enthusiastic uh, supporter of the Georgia Climate Project. Um, and we're centered around two central questions. What does changing climate mean for Georgia and what can we do about it? So understanding what is happening and also trying to identify solutions. As I mentioned, this is our fourth uh, webinar in the series. And with each webinar, we have been launching pages on the Georgia Climate Information Portal. So far, there are pages on uh, health, ecosystems, coast. Uh, we'll be putting the link in the chat. So please go and look at this one-stop shop of climate information for the state of Georgia. It has the latest science and projections um, and uh, links to other resources where you can get very localized information specific to our state. Our previous webinars are available for viewing on YouTube. Um, we've had a very esteemed uh, collection of speakers, as you can see. Uh, we'll also be posting the link to the YouTube channel in the chat um, so that you can go back and, and view those. And it really is a, a great synthesis for um, climate change in Georgia um, across and, you know, different sectors and um, perspectives and regions of the state. We invite you to follow us on social media, join us in, in conversation around this topic. Uh, we'll be putting those in the chat as well, the links so that you don't have to look them up. Um, but please join us on Twitter, Facebook, and um, Instagram. And finally, uh, we wanted to promote the Georgia Climate Conference, which is coming up in 2021. Uh, right now it is scheduled for April 28th to 29th on Jekyll Island. Um, there is a backup date of June if we need to, to bump it uh, due to COVID. Uh, right now there is um, a call for posters open, so please, uh, visit the website and uh, we hope to see you all there either uh, in April or June. So just some housekeeping, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a chat option and a Q&A option. Um, the chat is where you can introduce yourselves. Um, please do, please let us know who all is on here. Q&A is once we begin our presentations, you can ask questions and um, our speakers and moderator can actually respond in real time. Um, and they can also, uh, will flag questions to ask to answer live. Following uh, the webinar, you'll receive a uh, link popping up and also through email um, thanking you for attending to an evaluation. Please take a few minutes. It's a very short evaluation. We'd love to have your feedback, particularly about what um, additional subjects you'd like to hear about um, in the new year. So today we're going to be talking about what does the changing climate mean for Georgia's water resources. Our moderator is Dr. Rob McDowell. He's assistant professor of geology and environmental science at the Perimeter College of Georgia State University. Prior to joining, joining Georgia State, he was director of the environmental policy program for the University of Georgia Carl Vinson Institute of Government. Dr. McDowell also served for 16 years with the Georgia Environmental Protection Division, working as a senior geologist, program manager of the agricultural permitting unit, coordinator and principal author of the Lower Flint River Basin Regional Water and Conservation Plan, and assistant branch chief in the Watershed Protection Branch. 
So thank you all for joining us and I will turn it over to Dr. McDowell now. Okay, thank you very much, Jill. Uh, as she said, my name is Rob McDowell. I'll try to be the moderator uh, for today's webinar. There's a lot of moving parts. Uh, so uh, I, I, have to, I may have to be cruel uh, to make sure that all of our speakers uh, take no more than eight minutes. Uh, as Jill said, we'll talk about the different things that each, uh, uh, you'll have the opportunity to submit Q&A uh, depending on the topic that is being discussed. And as Jill also said, we're talking today about how climate change will affect Georgia's water resources. Georgia uh, is always prone to drought, of course, uh, but the frequency of drought has become more, uh, more uh, abundant. Um, we're gonna be having higher temperatures, we'll, which will increase uh, water use requirements, both for agriculture and municipal. Uh, we will have higher highs in terms of higher amounts of rainfall, higher stream flow, and then lower low, lower lows with respect to the, uh, to the droughts. Um, on top of this, there will be our regular population increases. So we're facing quite a number of challenges in Georgia with respect to changing water resources, planning for those changes in the water resource, in the changes in the water resources, and then at the same time, hopefully doing things to mitigate climate change as well as adapt to climate change. And the adaptations are gonna be at the statewide level down to the community level. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Mark Masters. Uh, Mark Masters serves as the director of the Georgia Water Planning and Policy Center at Albany State University. And he's um, a leading expert in agricultural water use and policy in the southeastern U.S. Throughout his career, Mark has led numerous research and outreach projects related to water resources in Georgia and has positioned the center as a trusted technical resource for the state and its water planning efforts. Professor Masters is active on a number of local, state, national advisory boards, including the American Farm Bureau Water Advisory Committee, the Governor's Soil and Water Advisory Committee, the Institute for Georgia Environmental Leadership Board of Directors, and as a supervisor for his local soil and water conservation district. I've had the great pleasure of uh, having known Mark for almost 20 years and work with him on a number of the agricultural water issues in South Georgia. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mark and um, uh, for our uh, participants, again, please feel free to uh, send in a Q&A using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. So Mark, I'll hand it off to you. All right, thanks, Rob. Um, can everyone see the slides? Give yes. me a thumbs up, Rob. Okay, good. So um, thank you for the introduction and really um, a, a, a true privilege to be here and, and to share just a few minutes with you uh, about, uh, you know, I, I, got the, I got the easy one, right? Too little water, what are we gonna do uh, about that? So we'll, we'll get into some of that in just a second, but a um, little, just a quick commercial about the Water Policy Center, been around since 99. And as Rob mentioned, we, we try very much to be a technical resource for the state. Uh, we do a lot of technical assistance work related to ag water use, but, but also some other things. I do a fair amount of facilitation work with regional water planning councils and, and lots of other partnerships uh, around. I've been with the center since 2003. Uh, and before that, uh, you see there in the top left of the screen, I was with the USDA. Um, that, that was uh, grad school, Mark, picture him. Um, but if, if you were able to zoom in on that poster, you would say the title of it is Ag Water Use and Resource Sustainability. So that picture was taken in the summer of 2001. Uh, so I've been, I've been working on this topic for, for a pretty good while and um, I'm really excited about the last 20 years and, and where things are now as, as opposed to where they were then. So uh, again, thank you to the Climate Project for the invitation and look forward to sharing with you for a couple of minutes and, and then uh, Q&A later on. So too little water. Well, that's what too little water in Southwest Georgia looks like. So I took this picture in July of 2012. I took it down in Spring Creek, a major tributary of the Flint down in the extreme Southwest Georgia. That was the second year of uh, really exceptional drought conditions that we experienced down there. And that's what, that's what Spring Creek looks like when uh, you have 
uh, almost no rain and, and, uh, and, and a fair amount of use. You kind of see, if you look right there in the middle, you see where the water level kind of wants to be uh, as opposed to where it is. So that, that's what it looks like when you go out and look in the resource. Well, if you're a nerd like me and you're interested in water stuff, you also dig around and look at the data. Well, the reason Spring Creek looked the way it did uh, is because, as I say, we were in the second year of exceptional drought. Uh, on the left, you see the drought monitor from July, uh, I think it was July 3rd of 2012 in Georgia. And then you see what that translates to in terms of stream flows in our state. Uh, and so, you know, particularly in Southwest Georgia, we were dealing with some really bad drought conditions. And those little red dots, if you're not aware, are bad. That means you're setting daily record low flows. And we were in fact, uh, right on the heels of setting daily record low flows the previous year. And so drought's a big deal, not just in Southwest Georgia, but, but uh, across the state. Um, but I, I wanna focus in on, on ag uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it's, it's water use sector I know the most about. Uh, but two, uh, when we talk about too little water or droughts, that's when ag you know, obviously uses the most. You know, when it's not raining, that's when ag is, is wanting to irrigate. And it's a big deal for the farmers, you know, too little natural rainfall is a bad thing. And so I've, I've used pictures like this for a long, long time. This picture I took last year, actually in 2019, um, you know, without irrigation, uh, corn looks like corn in the foreground, right? It, it's, it's basically useless, there's nothing there. It didn't grow at all. Um, and with irrigation, it looks like the nice green, pretty corn in the background. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm a farmer and, and, and in addition to a lot of other things I do, and I can tell you I want the corn in the background, not the foreground. And it, it means a lot to me as a farmer, but it means a tremendous amount to the regional economy and, and all, the, all the things uh, going on down in South of Georgia. So it's a really, really big deal. Uh, and the ability to put fresh water on crops is what makes South Georgia such a good place to grow things. So if we look at it from a statewide level, we irrigate about a million and a half, about a, maybe 1.6 million acres. Uh, I'm going to show you some data that, that demonstrates our producers are really efficient at getting water from a source to a crop, meaning very little waste. Um, something that's really important as we think about, you know, these, these drought conditions may be coming on uh, more often is that our surface water use in the state, but in particular, Southwest Georgia is actually down. Which is, which is a good thing using from those surface water sources. And, and then a big, big take home message and something I wanna leave you with is that our knowledge of ag water use in the state is light years ahead of where it was when I was standing out there in that field in 2001, talking about ag use and resource sustainability. We have much better acreage data, better water use data through meters, uh, which in turn improves our resource assessments. So this is a very well-traveled slide. I know a lot of people on this webinar have seen this before. Uh, the numbers haven't changed a whole lot, but what you see on the screen is, is really a, a solid take home and something I'm really, really proud of in terms of the center's ability to go out and collect this data. Uh, what you see reflects field level data collection on well over half a million acres in the state. 85% of it is being measured with a flow meter and if you add the two numbers at the bottom, 93, over 93% of it is irrigated using low pressure, drop nozzles, really highly efficient irrigation systems. And over on the right, there, there's been a big increase in the adoption of uh, soil moisture sensors and variable rate irrigation and all the apps and all the things that make farmers better stewards of the water resources that they have. All right, so where are we headed, all right? Um, so, so very much like, the Stewart County Road Department, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't know, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, Rob mentioned a lot of the models and, and, and the models are, are informative, but the fact of the matter is we, we, we don't know what's around the corner, right? And sometimes signs point us in ways that don't end up, don't end up happening. So but, but I guess here's the, the really the take on that I, I wanna, wanna leave you with. I am less concerned about where we are headed with respect to climate and all of that simply because I know and have a good understanding of where we are now. And so three, three kind of main take home points. One, the fact of the matter is the state of Georgia has a lot of water. We had record low flows in 11 and 12, record low groundwater levels in 11 and 12. 
But the fact is our streams and our aquifers are slap full today. So that's one. Um, the second one, you know, we have and collected all this information and data. We are in a much better position to, you know, tweak policy, adapt policy, uh, all of that, all that type of work that comes along later because of the investments that we've made over the last 15 years and in, in our understanding of ag use. And the third thing, and, and honestly the most important, is that we have a lot of we have a lot of rooms that look like this. Uh, I was thinking about about Rob's comment before he and I used to go to a lot of meetings together and, and he came down to Auburn about 20 years ago and had not nearly as cordial a meeting with a group of stakeholders about Flint River Drought Protection Act. And I'm sure he remembers that. What you see on the screen here is a group of stakeholders, river keepers, farmers, politicians, ex-politicians, you, you name it, all getting together to talk about water use in the Flint River Basin. The, the fact of the matter is, what, what gives me the most encouragement to deal with this climate issue is that in Georgia, for, for lots of reasons that I wish we could talk more about, we have people that you know used to maybe be disparate groups that are now all getting together to talk about issues, and, and, and Georgia's full of, full of those examples and really something that, that gives me an awful lot um, of encouragement. So I think my eight minutes is right on, Rob. Um, you are right on eight minutes. Thank really you. Really so look much. forward to the discussion. Um, I don't think we have any questions yet, but I do have a question for you, Mark. Uh, you mentioned that surface water use is down and groundwater use is up. Uh, how might that impact the simulative capacity if you decrease the amount of uh, surface water withdrawals for ag? Uh, how might that impact the assimilative capacity of um, cities in southwest Georgia like Albany? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I guess the simplistic answer, more water in the creek is better, right? Uh, so uh, I'm, I think any, anytime we can re reduce, the, um, re reduce the, the water use, you know, it's a one-to-one -one impact in terms of water out of the stream, uh, that, that's a good thing. The other thing I, I would like to point out is that, that that increase in groundwater use, particularly down in the lower Flint, ha has not come largely from the Florida that has that tight interconnection. It's come from, from other aquifers that have much less connection with the, with the surface water flows. So, so anytime we're able to you know, decrease our one-to-one -one impact uh, on those surface water flows, it's good for the, good for the ecology and, and I think good for, for discharges as well. With the change in uh, rainfall patterns, whether increased drought or increased heavy rains, is there any talk about changing cropping patterns or changing the main kinds of crops that are grown in, grown in Georgia? You, you know, Rob, a good question. I mean, there's there's always a little bit of talk here and there, and, and we've seen you know, we've seen some some increase in certain vegetable crops down in southwest Georgia to to a, to a small degree, but but by and large, we still grow what we're kind of built to grow, what we have the infrastructure to grow, peanuts, corn, cotton, uh, that, that type of thing. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, I, I think there's opportunity there because of those things I talked about before, my reason for optimism, uh, but because we do in fact have uh, abundant water resources in you know, eight years out of 10 or, or whatever. So I think there, there is some discussion of that, but at the same time, we're seeing you know, phenomenons that, that, that I, I never really thought about five years ago, certainly. We've taken over 5,000 acres out of center pivot irrigation and put it in solar panels in the last 24 months. So that that's something else that's that's coming in this mix. Uh, which is, it, it's a piece of that energy water nexus that I never you know thought about uh, until recently. So yeah, lo lots of lots of things. But um, you know, I, I think the main thing is figuring out smart policy to bridge those drought times that occur. Um, to, to keep the ag economy as dynamic as it can uh, and, and keeping that ecological sustainability that I talked about in my poster 20 years ago, uh, a, a real thing too. We have a question from Joe James asking, are there any problems with nutrient pollution in waterways? Uh, well, it's a <laughs> yeah, re really, really big question. Uh, th there are some, you know, three or three waters in, in down in Southwest Georgia. I mean, there's a there's databases there, there around the state. Uh, th there's some early work down here, and, and I would, would turn to, to folks on the panel that, that have expertise in other parts of the state. Uh, you know, at, at least from ag, there's some work looking at some, some groundwater uh, infiltration of, of nutrients here and there. The, the one thing that's interesting, and, and I, I host a, the IGEL group every year when they come to Southwest Georgia, and the question I, I pose to them when they do the paddle 
down the flint. And they'll say, what's the one thing you didn't see? And the one thing you won't see on the mason of the flint or on its tributaries is a field, <laughs> meaning we have pretty good riparian buffers and, and all of that. And, and so that helps in terms of, of, ag's, of, of ag's impact uh, on nutrients. But, you know, yeah, there's, uh, th there's nutrients concerns around the state and um, you know, happy to, to, to follow up with the, with the person that asked the question if, if there are specific examples they want to talk about. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, that's how we're going to be talking about too little water. Let's move on to Nataki Osborne Jelks, who's going to be talking about how Georgia will plan for too much water. Uh, Dr. Nataki Osborne Jelks is an assistant professor in the Environmental and Health Sciences Program at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. She investigates the connection between urban watersheds, pollution, the built environment, and health, as well as the urban environmental health disparities climate change impacts on low impact, on low income and communities of color. Uh, Dr. Jokes co-founded the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance known as Wawa, a community-based environmental justice organization that works to grow a cleaner, greener, healthier, more sustainable West Atlanta through authentic community engagement, organizing, education, community science, and research. So Nataki, can you please take it from here? Thank you so much. So um, as um, Dr. McDowell stated, we're gonna move into talking a little bit about uh, too much water. Um, so here you see a picture that was um, published in March of 2020. Um, this photo um, was taken in Crisp County, Georgia after Governor Kemp declared a state of emergency for all counties south of I-20 due to uh, heavy flooding. This is also a phenomenon that we have seen happening um, in the Atlanta metropolitan area where I sit. Um, this is a picture uh, and there are many from, from 2020 that I could have shared, um, but this one I thought was pretty dramatic from 2009, several years ago, um, in which we saw major flooding in different parts of the city of Atlanta um, and its suburbs, including Mableton, Georgia, where this photo was taken. As we think about some of what has already been shared in terms of the expectations around more precipitation, um, as, as well as um, higher stream flow, um, not only in coastal areas, but in, in urban areas, we've got to think about the impacts that um, these climate hazards can have, um, not only on the state of Georgia, but again, I'm, I'm sort of positioning things um, from my vantage point here in Atlanta, um, but obviously statewide, these are issues of concern. So I wanted to briefly just introduce a conceptual framework um, of climate change and health, because even though we're talking about water resources, what how I really want to connect the dots here um, is water resources and uh, issues related to health. So when you look at this conceptual model, you'll see a number of things, including uh, climate variability and change. Um, you'll see regional and local weather change, um, extreme weather events, temperature and precipitation. And so that sort of leads then to changes in different types of intermediate factors, um, changes in sea level, again, if we're talking about coastal areas. But um, when we think about these higher um, water flows, again, we're not just talking about coastal areas. But if you move to the last column, um, of this um, conceptual model, you'll see the adverse health effects. And while we know that there are a number of adverse health effects associated with climate change, when we kind of zero in on water resources, um, we can look at things like infectious diseases, um, water and foodborne diseases, vector and rodent borne diseases, and an increase of these. Um, we can look at things like malnutrition if we you know, are concerned about our crops being inundated with water, um, as opposed to um, maybe not having enough water. Um, and then in terms of um, injuries that might be related to people um, being impacted by flooding events uh, or by storm surges, as well as health problems of displaced populations. Um, and that is really important because there um, is the potential for people to be displaced, to be removed from their homes um, because of um, too much water um, in our state um, and too much water that may be associated with some of these extreme weather events events. If we kind of delve a little bit further in terms of some of the, um, the health outcomes that are associated with climate change, most of these impacts are expected to be adverse. 
Um, and we expect to see changes in frequency and severity of things that may be familiar. Um, so, you know, we're, we're aware that, you know, when flooding happens, whenever it happens, um, that, you know, there are impacts related to people's loss of property, um, damage of property, even, you know, loss of life. Um, but again, this is just to illustrate um, some of these health effects that are associated with human exposure um, and climate change. Again, um, there are various um, health effects associated with um, climate change, but if we focus in uh, on the water resources, um, then that leads us to talk about, um, you know, the entire population, um, but specifically how um, this can affect um, populations that are particularly vulnerable. Um, so again, when we think about the effects of populations that have been displaced, um, populations that you know lose property um, and other sorts of effects, and, and it's not just for our um, communities, but we also have to think about our businesses. There's an economic impact um, to all of this as well and a social impact. So when we talk about flooding in particular, there are some long and short-term effects. Um, in terms of long-term long -term or short-term uh, health consequences, excuse me, um, these can arise both during or soon after the flooding. Um, they can include injuries, um, infectious diseases or communicable diseases, exposure potentially to toxic pollutants. Um, excessive rainfall can facilitate the entry of human sewage and animal waste into waterways, um, into drinking water supplies, and that has the potential to increase the risk of waterborne diseases. Um, in urban areas like um, the city of Atlanta, where I live, um, we also have um, you know, antiquated, um, an antiquated sewer system in parts of our city, um, a combined sewer overflow system, um, which, you know, whenever there's a heavy rainfall event, we have raw untreated sewage mixed with storm water that um, gets into our creeks and streams that ultimately flow into the Chattahoochee River. So with um, more intense and more frequent flooding events, you can understand um, how we will see um, an increase potentially of these types of events um, in places where we have these pre-existing conditions, I call them, in terms of this aging uh, old infrastructure that already isn't protective enough. And so climate change um, and having um, more precipitation um, and uh, more frequent, you know, heavy rain events um, is something that will just exacerbate um, the impacts from those pre-existing conditions that we already experience. Um, Long-term effects may uh, occur a little bit longer. Um, you know, we can look at, again, things like, you know, crop loss in some parts of our state, um, but also issues around stress, um, around stress and trauma that people experience when they go through um, these situations where their homes are, are flooded, um, where the streets in their communities are flooded, um, where people <clears throat> lose property um, and damage. And in some cases, um, there have been or there can be um, situations where people may actually even lose their lives. This is another conceptual model that looks at um, flood losses and damages, and it breaks it down into primary, secondary, and tertiary losses. Um, and then also um, it breaks it down um, between economic, primarily social, and then environmental impacts. Um, so some of the things that I've already mentioned are here in terms of damage to things like buildings, again, residential, commercial, um, manufacturing settings. Um, so we're not just talking about communities, but we're also talking about things that have an impact uh, or have the potential to have an impact on the economy of our state. Um, we can also look at um, disruption in terms of agricultural production, industrial production, um, as well as, you know, the um, facilitation of healthcare services, um, the supply of utilities, um, electricity, for instance. Um, just recently, um, there were um, situations where communities lost power. I know where I live in Southwest Atlanta, people without power for five days and some of the recent storms that we've had. And then also loss of life and physical injury. Um, I'll close with just a few photos, a couple of photos from uh, some of our urban areas. Um, these are these two photos are from earlier this year um, with flooding events in the People's Town and Summerhill communities in Atlanta. Um, this set of photos um, show um, how communities have unfortunately been impacted by raw untreated sewage mixed with stormwater um, in flooding events. And I will end there. 
Thank you very much, uh, Nataki. Um, I, ha I have a question I'd like to ask. We did have a question coming in uh, from the chat, but I also live in Atlanta, and you mentioned some neighborhoods that I live very close to. Do you find that stormwater mitigation efforts tend to follow gentrification? Great question. Um, that that is that is the conclusion that I've come to. Um, we have a number of our in town neighborhoods, um, particularly neighborhoods that are um, heavily populated by uh, communities of color. You know, primarily communities of color, where there appears to have been a lack of investment um, over a, a long period of time into things that would strengthen um, our stormwater um, and other parts of our water infrastructure. Now we definitely are seeing um, increased investments in some of these areas. We're also seeing increased development in these areas. And so the likely conclusion there is that um, some of this gentrification and sort of this new interest in some of these in-town neighborhoods um, that have been divested, um, the resources have been divested um, from for a number of years, um, now are kind of on the radar, they're getting investments, and we're beginning to see some fixes in terms of our stormwater infrastructure in these very communities. All right, thank you. Um, do we have any indication, uh, one of the things that, that we have we're finding out, um, some research has recently shown that Atlanta is the third most likely city for climate refugees around the southeast. Um, where do you think those refugees might be settling in the Atlanta area and how might that uh, complicate stormwater mitigation and, and um, other issues of too much water? Well, that, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure exactly where those refugees will will congregate um, or will settle down. Um, what I can say is that because of um, many of the new investments that are being made in different parts of the city, um, it makes the city a lot more attractive um, if people can, if those refugees can afford um, to live in those areas. And so I do think that that can further complicate things for communities that are already in place, um, populations that have been um, in some of these neighborhoods um, in Atlanta for for generations and now are being faced um, with the with threats of um, displacement because of the gentrification because of um, you know rising home prices um, rising rental prices so those who are you know renters are especially vulnerable um, and because of you know a lot of the new investment um, and because of you know some of what the city is beginning to look at in terms of um, the urban ecology framework and how to um, sort of maximize things like our tree canopy, you know, wild development is happening, it makes the city a lot more attractive in terms of the city core as opposed to perhaps the suburbs. All right. Well, thank you very much, Nataki. Uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker is um, Dr. Amy Roseman from the University of Georgia. Uh, Professor Roseman studies the effects of land use change and climate change on the health and vitality of streams and rivers. A professor of ecology in the Odom School of Ecology at the University of Georgia. She is a fellow of the Ecological Society of America, the 2018 recipient of UGA's Creative Research Medal in Science and Engineering, and president of the Society for Freshwater Science. Her research program is motivated by society's need for healthy, resilient freshwater ecosystems and the goods and services they provide. Her current studies are focused on how elevated temperature and nutrient pollution levels affect stream functions. So, uh, Amy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Rob, and thanks everyone for attending today. Uh, and I just want to give us a view from the stream. So, uh, these these issues from the perspective of a stream ecosystem pale somewhat in comparison when we talk about human life and well-being. But we do need these systems to continue to provide services to us in the future. And that's why we need to be mindful of the health and uh, functioning of our, of our freshwater ecosystems. So I want to use our, this salamander as a little bit of a guide uh, because they're integrating the whole food web and also showing us how uh, multiple stressors can have negative effects on our aquatic ecosystems. The first thing that we have to acknowledge is that climate change is about more than one stressor. And a stressor is anything that negatively impacts our freshwater systems 
the organisms or ecosystem functions. Two main stressors that I think we should keep in mind is you know, this issue of altered hydrology, too much or too little water, and also temperature, rising stream water temperatures. These stressors interact with things that are already going on in these systems, like the common problem of nutrient pollution and how that interacts with temperature. Layered on top of that is what we're predicting for the future, not only of climate change, but of um, increased demand on our freshwater systems due to increased population growth. So I wanna show just how some of these stressors affect the structure and function of aquatic systems. And with this illustration, you know, here's our friend, the salamander and this mayfly shown larger than actual size, uh, depending on the food resources in stream ecosystems. So in many streams and rivers on down to lakes, these organisms are dependent on these inputs that come from forest and any riparian vegetation. Uh, we call this brown carbon, and it really does support the production of stream organisms. Alternative food is algae. So some algae is good, too much algae is bad. And that algae is stimulated by things like nutrient pollution and clearing that riparian canopy. And as nutrients move downstream to our reservoirs and coastal zones, that those give rise uh, to harmful algal blooms. So what I've shown here is just um, with altered hydrology that tends to scour out that all of these food resources to our organisms. And that's one mechanism by which climate change affects these food webs. Another way is that temperature increases in temperature just result in increased decomposition rates of this great brown carbon that enters streams. So this is just of a, a stream here in Athens where I live. And you can see all these uh, dead leaves. Hopefully when you go home today, you'll see um, in any riparian area, those dead streams are gonna fuel these food webs. But studies that we're doing in my lab, Carolyn Cummins is leading these, shows that increases in temperature increases the rate that this carbon breaks down and quickly moves downstream. So it's not there to support the food web. So both altered hydrology and increases in temperature affect these food resources for stream organisms. But temperature also has additional effects in changing uh, the suitable habitat for organisms um, and also by affecting the amount of dissolved oxygen uh, in streams and rivers. This is a study from a colleague of mine uh, from some Western streams that show habitat uh, distribution of cutthroat trout currently into the 2040s and the 2080s. We can make these sorts of projections, but uh, it's sort of bad news as we project increases in temperature, you see less distribution of these trout with fewer of these dark dots. And uh, how these scenarios will play out in Georgia is that our cold adapted species like trout and our beloved stream salamanders are going to um, lose habitat just because of the physiological constraints of not being able to persist where temperatures are warmer. Related to this is that dissolved oxygen concentrations just based on physics are going to be lower in warmer water. So remember that as um, just because of solubility, warmer water holds less dissolved oxygen than colder water. So something like a two degree increase in temperature here on this X axis is gonna result in a reduction in dissolved oxygen on the order of about a half a milligram per liter for an increase in two degrees centigrade. So when we think about, uh, again, these mechanisms, we alter the food resources for organisms, 
we change their distribution because of their physiology and we also are reducing dissolved oxygen. Then we have other stressors like nutrient pollution to consider and the effects that that will have. What's clear globally and in the state of Georgia is that harmful algal blooms are increasing. They're on the rise because of these two stressors, increases in nutrients stimulate uh, algal growth. Increases in temperature are particularly beneficial to these harmful algae, most of which are in this group, the cyanobacteria. And this figure shows that at higher temperatures, these cyanobacteria like it hot. So we provide um, that set of conditions, higher temperatures and higher nutrient concentrations, and that gives rise to harmful algal blooms. Here's what's happening to our systems, and yet we are going to experience increased demand on these freshwater systems as well. And I just want to illustrate what those demands look like from the uh, Upper Oconee water planning region, a uh, part of the state water plan. So the state of Georgia should be commended for this, the water plan that it developed in 2008. And now we have these regional plans. Um, some of the people um, attending this webinar and are very involved in this. Uh, so we're refining these at the region level. Uh, but I wanna make a point about that we really need to include future climate change effects in these plans. One aspect is that our streams are not in good condition in the first place. 70% uh, are not currently supporting their designated use in the upper Oconee. <laughs> that um, we are also limited in our assimilative capacity. Again, this is from the upper Oconee regional plan. So that loss in DO is a big deal that I talked about that'll come just as a, uh, as a function of increased temperature. That increased assimilative capacity is projected. Um, and again, this is from that regional water plan. Amy, I'm sorry, I have to stop you there so that we have uh, time for any questions and some discussion. Okay. Uh, we have to move on to the next uh, presenter in just a minute. I do have one question though. How far downstream do you think that these ultra hydrology effects are gonna be? And I'm thinking specifically of its impact on coastal marshes and coastal fisheries. We have one minute, can we give you a, an answer? Can you give me an answer in one minute? Yeah, it's all about the, you know, what happens upstream connects to downstream. And I think we have all kinds of capacity to uh, protect you know, the uh, water resources, all those little streams give rise to what happens on the coast. So getting serious about land use protection in the headwaters and smaller streams will really protect our coastal areas. All right. Well, thank you very much, Amy. And we're gonna move on to the uh, part three of our presentation today of our webinar. And that is what can Georgia do about all of these different hydrological changes that we're gonna be experiencing. And our next speaker is uh, Catherine Atterbury uh, from the uh, Atlanta Regional Commission and Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District. Catherine Atterbury is a water professional and Georgia native. Since 1999, Catherine has worked for government and the private sector to plan and implement stormwater management and watershed protection programs. Currently, she is the stormwater planning manager for the Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District. In this role, she provides planning and regulatory support to improve and preserve water quality through community partnerships, education, and policy guidance. She has a BS in environmental health and a master of public administration from the University of Georgia. So Catherine, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, and I think we know that there's a very short amount of time to learn a lot of new things. So I'm just gonna jump right in here with our Metro Water District Climate Utility Study. 
the, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Metro North Georgia Water Planning District is a 15 county metro area. Uh, it was formed in 2001 by our state legislature. Um, and as Amy mentioned earlier, uh, there's other state planning districts now, but um, the Metro Water Planning District was one of them. You'll hear me call us the district. And specifically what we were trying to do is establish strategies for water supply, conservation, watershed management and uh, wastewater treatment. And really we were looking to develop an integrated approach with that. Now, when we talk about risk, there's mixed signals, right? So if we're trying to, to share that information, sometimes we see in the news that we've got Atlanta flooding, other times we're looking at drought and it's just really, you know, sometimes it just feels like we're all over the map uh, with, with that risk. And I mean, even averages can be misleading, right? So typically we look at an average annual rainfall in the Metro Atlanta area of about 50 inches. But then when you really dig into some of those details, again, there's a lot of variability, right? We've got periods of, of drought, we've got periods of flooding. And especially when you look at those last 20 years, you see a lot more variability compressed into a shorter amount of time. Now with our study, uh, we had within the Metro District, we felt like it was worth a utility a climate resiliency study to make sure that we were um, looking at that risk and doing our best not to predict future climate conditions or the likelihood that a specific condition could occur, but to identify the potential climate conditions that if they would occur, would create specific risks to water resources within the district. Now, any future climate variability will create risks to water and water related facilities. So what we really wanted to do was define our types of risks and then look at the potential ranges of, of how we could address those risks. And again, since we don't know which trends are most likely, we wanna monitor climate trends and plan adaptively, and then also consider preemptive measures that are low cost and low risk and can be beneficial regardless of which scenario plays out. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Now, um, when we started the study, we considered a broad range of scientific studies. Uh, we looked at actually over 100 global climate models and then grouped that into six different trends, most of which you see here, the hot, dry, hot, wet, warm, dry, warm, wet, and then a central tendency, which is uh, expressed as that number one. And then we also used one that was just based on historic records, just extending that historic record, um, just based on what we'd seen in the past. And generally we saw um, a big picture trend. We were looking at warmer and wetter conditions, uh, but we also saw with everything an increase in temperature. So uh, I thought that was pretty noteworthy. And I'm not gonna dive into a ton of details here, but I will say you can see this full study at northgeorgiawater.org and it's very easy to Google. So um, just, I encourage you to do that. It's, it's 170 pages of awesome information. But big picture, what we found was that primary climate impacts as related to water quality, uh, we saw a decrease in annual low flows, an increase in water temperatures, a decrease in dissolved oxygen. As it relates to watersheds, we saw an increase in storm frequency and intensity, higher peak stream flows, and an increase in pollutant loading. And for water supply, our test case reservoir yield could either decrease by 10% or increase by up to 30%. So we've got a big range that we found there, but the tendency uh, was definitely towards more frequent and severe drought. So what do we do with that, right? Uh, we had some responses uh, to key impacts that, that we worked to develop. Uh, they kind of fall into two categories, our preemptive strategies and our adaptive strategies. Those preemptive strategies I've mentioned before, those near-term no regret recommendations that regardless of, of which trend plays out, uh, we would be able to express multiple benefits from those, those strategies. And then our adaptive strategies were a little more specific and um, they help us reduce our vulnerability to specific climate trends, uh, but would require just more check-ins, right? So we'd be looking at the trends and then making decisions based on those trends. With our preemptive measures, again, drilling down a little further, uh, there's a lot of recommendations within the plan, but uh, specifically I wanted to highlight one just as an example and um, the water quality preemptive measure for green infrastructure. I wanted to dive in a little deeper there. Uh, we have green infrastructure, for those of you that aren't familiar, 
uh, it uses vegetation, soils, and other elements to manage our stormwater runoff. You see picture here is a, a rain garden or bioretention. And it does two different things uh, for us, regardless of climate trend. Uh, it helps us manage our stormwater quantity and also our stormwater quality. So if we're managing our quantity, we're reducing flooding from increased storm depths. Uh, and that can come result in some solutions, you know, uh, less need for redundancy, things like that for our wastewater and water treatment systems. Uh, when we talk about water quality, uh, we're reducing our non-point source pollutant loads and providing improvements to that. So we want to make sure that we are uh, doing those things. Uh, with our adaptive measures, just an example quickly, uh, we had impacts, issues, and scenarios with some strategies that are a little more specific. I see Rob here, he's making me nervous. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel like I'm gonna get the hook. So uh, our conclusion, any future climate variability creates risk to water and water related facilities. And because we don't know which ones are going to happen, we wanna use adaptation and these preemptive measures. And specifically in our 2017 water resources management plan, uh, we added a requirement for our wastewater utilities to include a section in the next update of their water and wastewater master plans entitled climate resiliency to discuss the, partic the particular vulnerabilities. And I have two examples very briefly for you. In the city of Atlanta, their wastewater master plan uh, they have a sustainability and climate resiliency section that includes some really great objectives uh, that reducing energy usage and transitioning to clean energy sources, increasing operation and facility efficiency, enhancing resource recovery and reducing chemical usage at their water reclamation centers. And then finally, in Cherokee County, they've conducted some water system master planning and they've used it as an opportunity to prepare for drought and evaluate a range of actions that they could take. And specific to capital improvement projects, they've identified projects that would mitigate drought impacts and even looked into evaluating some long-term financing options for those projects. So um, good examples there for local jurisdictions taking those recommendations to heart. And with that, I You've got a great about. question about uh, riparian buffers and tree cover uh, from the Q&A. And could you answer that question? Oh, yes, let me open the Q&A. Um, oh, I see well, one from Mark. Do you have it in front of you, Rob? I, I thought I did. It disappeared. Uh, it was from Catherine K. Carolyn. Oh, K. here we go. Okay. Um, important, how important riparian tree cover is for moderating temperature and protecting streams from excess heat. Uh, it does have Amy in front of this, but uh, I will say just really important. Um, there's a, a lot of value in stream buffers and um, the, you know, they can absorb nutrients, they can provide a reduction in temperature, uh, all of those things all, um, all work together to, to improve our, our water resources. Um, so I'm sure Amy has a, a more sci scientific answer, but uh, I like would say just generally, yes. It's as a resident of the city of Atlanta, I see more and more trees being cut down in spite of the fact that we call ourselves the city of the trees. And I would imagine that this is going to be something that's very important with respect to maintaining water quality, uh, even environmental justice issues for uh, providing shade, et cetera, et cetera. Even the roots holding in stream banks and, and exactly. keeping them stable and not allowing them to, to fall in. So again, the numerous values. I believe the district did a uh, 2015 climate resiliency plan. That is that is the study, yes, that I just talked about. Mm -hmm. When is the next one? <laughs> well, um, we have talked about updates. We probably won't do an update to the study until 2025. Um, you know, these are trends and they take a long time to develop. So, um, you know, we have a lot to let's say unpack uh, from this study and um, so we'll probably take a little bit longer before we do an update but it is something that we've discussed. Okay that's very good to know thank you very much. Um, climate change and the response to climate change and the whether it's mitigation or adaptation is basically going to be a human issue and our last speaker uh, is my old friend Daryl Haddock who is the education director of the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. Uh, he is primed to discuss this particular issue. Uh, Daryl completed Jacksonville University with a BA in geography, 
and recently graduated from Georgia State University with a master's degree in geoscience and applied GIS. Daryl has over 20 years of professional experience as an environmental scientist, working for the consulting firm Dames and More as a principal investigator with USGS on a subsurfing, subsurface mapping project, and as an environmental specialist for the state of Georgia, EPD, which is where I met him 25 years ago. Both Environmental Leadership Program and Toyota Together Green National Audubon Society recognized Daryl as a fellow and emerging leader in the environmental and conservation movements. Daryl coordinates educational programs, community outreach, and citizen science research activities and participates in Wawa's day-to-day -day operations. This is the man on the ground in the field who is helping the communities deal with climate change. So Daryl, I will pass it off to you. Thank you. And I'll share my screen and start my talk by just recognizing that while Wawa is a very place-based organization, we have made uh, many inroads in connecting urbanites to the vast statewide resources um, and a recognition of the power that we have collectively in this state. Um, and we have really tried to lift up new narratives in the way that communities of color are engaging in these conversations. So I wanna thank you all for allowing me to uh, be a part of this talk today. Um, so what you see before you are the three watersheds in Metro Atlanta that Wawa stewards. Um, you can see maybe in this particular slide that the three West Side watersheds um, all um, end up in the Chattahoochee. So we are doing work in the Chattahoochee watershed, but certainly because of our position um, in the city of Atlanta, we connect not only hydrologically, but socially and culturally with the rest of our state. So one critical question has been lifted up in this particular slide is how will the state mitigate some of the things that we've heard about today? And it's really exciting to follow the previous conversation because I'm actually gonna focus on trees as that leverage point so um, that we could address climate variation, we could ad address community resilience, and we can also address water through this conversation about trees. Now, we note that um, communities of color are often vulnerable uh, in terms of these issues, and Itaiki certainly touched on many of them. Um, but when having community conversations, it's also important to start with the positive. One of the tools that Wawa uses in terms of community engagement is something called appreciative inquiry. And appreciative inquiry is a, is a method of engagement uh, or strategic planning, if you will, that allows us to focus on the positives. And so one of the things that we love to start out on, especially when we have conversations about resiliency, is that resiliency is oftentimes a reflection of strength. Um, while we definitely need to recognize you know, what has come before, and those are certainly uh, key and inherent to where we wanna move to for a future, for a just and brighter future, we also can recognize that there are always existing strengths in every community. And we make sure that community can speak in their own voice when it comes to what they like to see in terms of their vision. Uh, and so there's been a lot of data collected and has been shared today on how deforestation could impact water quality and community resilience. Some of the work that we do is culturally relevant. We figure that we um, are able to use this culturally relevant environmental education or citizen or community science to make tangible, accessible um, access points for communities to speak about their own conditions. And we are utilizing a lot of current data. Um, so one of the data points that we'll be talking a little bit about today is the urban canopy study that Trees Atlanta was involved in, um, but also looking at how um, the USDA Forest Service iTree data and other data is being used by Wawa to reach um, broader communities by including the communities that we work in. 
Wawa has been highly focused in community science and community education initiatives. And one of the things that I really think is a very positive thing to leave in this space is that communities are very active in a way that's oftentimes not seen by many of us uh, environmental or conservation professionals. Sometimes communities of color are not invited to tables or maybe not seen uh, as perhaps knowledgeable about some of the issues, or perhaps there are other social or economic issues that might be front and center that oftentimes creates a perception that we might not be able to, to sit at the table. And I like to challenge that perception to say that no, communities are very aware of what is going on. They um, come with local knowledge um, that could influence and impact the plans that we've been talking about today. And we really need to find ways to um, invite more community conversations. Um, some of the things that we have seen over time is sometimes communities are seen as the angry folks and it creates a lot of anxiety and tension by some of us uh, professionals and we may not feel comfortable sitting in those spaces. So I want to recognize that there is a lot of opportunity based on what we've heard today to foster and invite more community participation across the state and some of the things that we've been addressing and hearing about. There are a lot of opportunities that I want to leave us with in terms of community engagement. So in terms of the data that uh, we've been looking at, especially around the urban canopy, leveraging community data sets like the ones that I have here, and this is taken from the, tree, the Trees Atlanta Tree Canopy Study. In Atlanta, we were able to look at this data and see, for example, that the majority of tree canopy is is, is residential, right? Single family residential. So this allows us to bring in and focus messaging for these urban single family homeowners that they actually can care for and steward some of the old growth forest that we have on the west side, for example. We could take that same message and build it out across the state, emphasizing the importance of how tree canopy can, can aid in that riparian buffer conversation, for example, or how tree canopy helps with stormwater retention and mitigates against some of the flooding that Nataki has raised. We've also been highly involved in the parks conversation. Um, we've participated in the onboarding of many community parks. And Rob mentioned how the, the, the uh, impacts of perhaps green gentrification create some anxiety around you know, do we want these types of green infrastructure, low impact development in certain communities? Well, we need to foster the community engagement that allows residents to share their concerns and be a part of the design of these types of technologies so that they can be a part of the implementation strategy. And we know, and we have seen, for example, in the Proctor Creek watershed, what that community level um, engagement has looked like that has included residents in park design. And so a lot of the parks that you now see uh, in the Project Creek watershed were, were co-designed by professionals and community members. I knew this was gonna be a short conversation. I wanted to leave a lot of opportunity for us to have questions, but one of the things that I would like to, to, to kind of leave on the table in, in terms of community engagement is that I think we, we need a bigger tent, especially in terms of the stress of what we've seen nationally and in our state um, in terms of the pandemic, in terms of some of the flashpoints of racial tension, and certainly with this highly stressful election uh, cycle. So I want to hopefully leave us with some optimism that these conversations should be front and center and that we should be bold and courageous in perhaps having some of these uncomfortable conversations that need to be had so that we can make sure equity is included in, in most of the state planning that we've talked about today. Daryl, thank you very much. That was, uh, that was outstanding. Uh, there's a question actually coming from Dr. Osborne Jelks. Can you briefly talk about community engagement to press for green infrastructure solutions in Atlanta communities? highly impacted by flooding. 
So one of the tools that we've co helped co-develop is something called the Watershed Learning Network. And in the Watershed Learning Network, we work with several partners that have invited conversations that have actually worked to build a capacity and efficacy of local leaders, local neighborhood and community leaders to understand what is, is green infrastructure, for example, where are some of the places that it might need to be placed in terms of local flooding. And then those community leaders uh, go through six modules that allow them to understand the, the technical aspects of, of implementing green infrastructure. And then they're ready to participate in the planning that might you know, occur with an engineering company or the city of Atlanta Office of Watershed Management. And so this Atlanta Watershed Learning Network is now expanding beyond Metro Atlanta. We started out in the Proctor Creek watershed. Uh, we included Entrenchment Creek uh, in some subsequent cohorts. Now we're working with the Upper Flint. And now there's been calls that we take this uh, Atlanta Watershed Learning Network and move it out nationally. And we've actually gotten some resources from UGA uh, to design a website that allows us to put that content out uh, so that there's some national access to what it is that we're doing. But we really feel like this community education is really the, 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 the fulcrum uh, for what it is that uh, we believe is that um, an, an important process of including communities. And I just close this statement by saying, you know, Wawa looks at a very intergenerational K to gray approach. So everyone in the community is uh, invited to have that participation, not just at the K-12 level, not just as adults, but as I mentioned, K, K to gray. All right. Well, thank you very much. Now we're going to move into the, uh, our closing panel discussion. All the panelists will be available to uh, answer questions from our uh, participants and to engage in discussion with each other. And uh, I don't know how to make us go to uh, the Brady Bunch view. So um, Norman, if, if you can get us there, I'd be grateful. In the meantime, does anybody have any, there we go. Does anybody have any additional questions? Um, actually, here's one that came up. Uh, uh, Nataki, could you talk about strategies you use to promote community involved data collection? That could maybe be a way that more of us can be involved in documenting some of the issues we see with regard to flooding, water quality, tree health, et cetera. Thank you for that question. I think I can just sort of build on what Daryl started to talk about. Um, the approaches that I use are very grounded um, in um, this idea that there is valuable knowledge that community residents have. They don't have to be experts. They don't have to be um, ecologists or hydrologists or engineers, um, but through their everyday lived experiences, people have ways of knowing they understand and see. Um, maybe they don't always fully understand, you know, some of the mechanisms, but, you know, they can tell you things like where it floods. <laughs> Um, and what we found is that it's very powerful if we listen to those community voices, if we elevate that lived experience. Um, and I partner with communities to try to begin to document and collect data on things that are of importance to the community. Um, some of those things have included things like identifying locations where it, where, um, when there are heavy rain events, you know, where it tends to flow, where the water stands um, for, for days. Um, you know, that could lead to, you know, uh, mosquitoes and, and, and that sort of thing. And we know that some of these areas are, have been found in other studies to be high risk for things like West Nile virus. Um, community me members have also been interested in trying to document um, where stormwater fixes are needed in their communities, you know, where um, there may be infrastructure in place, but it's inoperable, or they've identified locations where that infrastructure could be implemented, like where green infrastructure could be helpful. Um, and so those approaches, um, you know, kind of take developing relationships with communities and going through a process of co-design. One process that um, I and Daryl and others have worked on um, was to design a mobile application with community residents, what we called uh, in the Proctor Creek watershed specifically, um, it was the Proctor Creek Citizen Science mobile app. 
And two things that the community wanted to identify specifically were places where it floods um, and where the stormwater infrastructure needed fixing. And so this was important because community members felt like they had been raising these issues to local officials and that those officials were not as clued in um, to where some of these major problems were happening. And in fact, sort of challenged the community that, you know, it, we don't know about these issues. You know, it, it seems a little exaggerated. And so by being able to collect GPS coordinates, photos, um, video and other data that the community thought was important, they've be, be, been able to start to build kind of this compelling case um, that there are issues and challenges um, happening that, you know, sometimes are uh, municipal and other officials are just not aware of because they're not, you know, necessarily in these communities every day. Um, and it's been, it's opened the door to more community engaged um, processes that um, are getting the community more involved in things like designing uh, green infrastructure projects and also developing ideas around the types of benefits that we want to see from these projects um, because they have the opportunity for multi solving. They don't have to just be environmental um, benefits, but there can be social and economic benefits as well. All right, thank you very much. Um, this is a, a question I'm going to throw to, to uh, uh, Amy. Um, we know that there has been a very measurable uh, increase in rainfall intensity over the past, but Todd Stevenson wants to know to what degree, if any, has rainfall increase, especially peak rainfall intensity data, been forecast? Mm. What are we expecting in the future in terms of these uh, heavy downpours? Yeah, well, I think we, we really know just the generalities. We're going to see higher highs and lower lows, you know, and um, more intensity in rainfall, longer periods of rainfall. And I think what Nataki and Daryl remind us of is in urban systems, that's, that's where the rubber really meets the road. All that impervious surface cover, that's what brings these into our stream and river systems and causes great disturbance. Uh, and so really, uh, using natural infrastructure and green infrastructure is one of the tools that we have to um, live more in harmony with uh, the nature that's coming down the road. Uh, and there are these new relationships. Uh, University of Georgia has just uh, developed a networking relationship with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers called the Network for um, Noon uh, Engineering with Nature. And um, so we're, you know, working with all kinds of people, coastal resilience, Jill Gamble is involved in this, um, all the way into stream restoration. And so figuring out how to live with this rainfall um, and so to cause less damage to human lives and infrastructure is where we need to have our eye in the future. Um. Understandably, this is a question from Chris Goodson. I'm just going to throw this to the panel because there's a few of you who have uh, some good insights into this. A focus has been on the impacts and strategies for municipal developments. What strategies or takeaway message would you give for the transportation industry, specifically regarding roadways which bisect and impact waters across the state? Catherine, that might be one for you. Sir. Certainly. Um, so the Georgia Stormwater Management Manual has over 26 practices that are available for stormwater management, and they include both green practices and more traditional um, just water quality quantity management practices. Uh, but a lot of those are actually linear practices. So for example, bioslopes are a great example of a way that we're um, trying to infiltrate water as it runs off our roadways. Um, and so it's my personal opinion that we aren't um, exploring all of the interesting practices in our manual maybe. We get kind of set on a detention pond and we're not getting into some of the more like a regenerative stormwater conveyance. We don't see a lot of those in Georgia. And I would just encourage people to look for those practices that address linear, um, linear facilities, whether it's a roadway or a sidewalk um, and, and maybe just see what the manual has to offer. Amy, you're nodding your head a lot. Did you uh, want to add anything? Yeah, I just, you know, we have such an opportunity. We're, we're all living on 
aged infrastructure. And um, as we replace aging infrastructure, that's giving rise to things like fecal coliform bacteria and nutrients because septic and sewage systems are leaky, uh, we need to employ a lot of these creative strategies. They're out there and um, we need to uh, figure out how we want to do infrastructure in the future. The uh, thank you. Um, uh, Mark, I have a question for you. Um, since you are so tied into agriculture and you're a farmer yourself, uh, my recollection is that the agricultural community is somewhat resistant to uh, accepting uh, the, the science and the, the reality of, of climate change, even though they're going to be so directly impacted by it. Are you seeing any kind of a, of a sea change there in attitudes? You know, Rob, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> it may, may be, may be averse to calling it something, whether it's climate change or whatever. And, and I don't know, I, I think that's probably softening some. But the one thing that they're not averse to is their understanding of risk. And so whether they call it climate change or anything else, they understand risk. They understand what 2011 and 12 looked like, and they don't want to see that again. Um, and so as, as they think about their operations, they think about under, needing to sit at some of those tables that you know I showed a picture of earlier. Uh, I, I, I certainly think there's there's certainly a softening that we've seen since you were down here in the basin uh, 20 years ago doing stuff that understanding that the, that the whole system is connected and that they need to play a role in you know the management of that system and so you know whether whether or not you get eight farmers out of ten to say yeah I believe in climate change or not to me is is frankly irrelevant helping them understand the risk associated with it I, I, I think is, is is more important and and I think we've made a lot of headway there. Um, I, I do want to touch on real quick, Rob, you talked about aging infrastructure and, and transportation and everything else. We, we have the most aged infrastructure down here in Southwest Georgia, and those are dirt roads. Um, and so there's a, there's a big issue, and we've spent a lot of time working with our partners at the Golden Triangle and some other places, updating the Better Back Roads manual and how we maintain those things, because there is a, they are a huge impact to the waterways in, South, in rural Georgia in terms of turbidity and nutrients and all that kind of stuff getting in there. Uh, we've done a lot of work with the Soil and Water Commission and a couple other folks. It, you know, compared to the transportation issues that Catherine is dealing with up in, in Metro, yeah, not so much, but it's a transportation issue for some folks in, in rural Georgia and it's a water issue too. So uh, don't, don't, don't forget about our dirt roads out here in Georgia. We, we got issues with them as well. No, no, I, I remember, I remember uh, the impact that uh, heavy rain can have on those, on those, uh, those back roads, those back dirt roads in Georgia. And you bring up something that I wanted to uh, ask uh, Daryl and Nataki about, and one of our pan one of our uh, participants has raised it. Um, the Georgia Association of Conservation Districts provided funding to property owners to install some green infrastructure. Um, are there other efforts from related agencies thinking about this in Atlanta and other Georgia cities? And so Daryl, yeah. this sort of ties in. You're both talking about um, relatively sophisticated networks in Atlanta that are gonna be addressing green infrastructure and uh, especially in underserved communities. What is being done in the other cities like Macon or Albany, Georgia in Southwest? Uh, so some of the conversations that we've been having um, resulted in the funding that you, you mentioned, um, residential scale stream bank restoration. Um, funding that is a, is, a, is a difficulty for uh, communities that, um, communities of color that live along stream banks. And usually they're not able to pay private, you know, restoration companies to come in and do that work. And so it was very exciting for, you know, us to see that funding become available for, for Atlanta and, and much of Fulton County and the neighboring metro areas. But I think just like Atlanta had to do, we also have to look at more creative opportunity for funding, like the EIB, the Environmental Impact Bond. I think other cities have to kind of think outside the box because just like Atlanta, we don't, they may not have um, a revenue stream that allows them to do what need, is needed to be done through just ratepayer uh, resources. And so I think we need to build this out 
and make sure there are various types of ways um, that low income minority communities of color um, and others that might be cash strapped um, can find ways to pay for the work that needs to be done. I don't have anything to add to that. Um, I, I don't know what is specifically happening in those other cities, but I would just agree that these conversations need to happen. And it's all about being creative. You know, here in the city, um, you know, there are many who wanted to really push the idea of something called a stormwater utility. So that, you know, um, politically um, is, is not really uh, feasible, but, um, you know, looking at these other creative ways um, to provide, you know, um, financing support is, is really critical. Are there organizations like uh, Wawa in Macon and Columbus, where there are uh, large underserved communities? I think we have to think differently um, about some of those partners. Um, Wawa certainly, you know, is not an, you know, an analogy, um, you know, um, we, so I would say there are probably social justice and civil rights organizations. They're probably faith-based organizations that have taken on um, a lot of the work that Wawa has done. Um, Nataki is a member of NEJAC, the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council. And, and that body has been working in communities for decades and she may wanna to speak to that network. But even if they're not environmental or conservation um, missioned organizations, there's cert there certainly are communities of color that can speak to the work that's being done in their community. Ms. Aki? I, I would agree with that. And I would definitely lift up um, Harambe House and Citizens for Environmental Justice in Savannah, Georgia, who's really looking at coastal impacts. Um, that's one organization that we um, you know, collaborate with and, and work with quite a bit. And we're learning from what they're doing there um, and looking at ways to implement some of that work here as, as well. Thank you both very much. Uh, Amy, um, you talked about the, the changing hydrology and the impacts on uh, stream biota. I asked a question about its downstream impacts. Um, right now, Mark is currently answering a question about farm ponds. But I wonder, uh, I mean, of course, we have the striped bass in the Flint River uh, in South Georgia. Uh, do you see any potential for collaboration uh, with uh, South, with the, 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 the Water Planning and Policy Center and all the different organizations in Southwest Georgia with your research on, um, on changing hydrology? Yeah, I think just um, taking a, <clears throat> a larger scale view that goes from headwaters to the coast and really thinking about how we're maintaining the function of streams and not causing problems along the way. Um, you know, but it's, it's everyone, every municipality leaving the water as good as they got it. You know, we all know how many toilets and faucets water runs through by the time it goes to the coast, how many ag fields it's seen. And I think if, if we have better monitoring and assessment, better care of the land, um, that we can work together and have that water high quality all the way down. Um, that really is gonna take a much more comprehensive view of how we're all connected. And to Daryl's point, I think um, is changing our values in um, our stewardship of our resources, uh, having humility about um, what our needs are, um, what Mother Nature may have in store for us, uh, and you know, being better to our neighbors downstream who are going to use the water um, that we need access to too. Thank you, uh, Catherine. I have a question for you. Um, of course, um, ARC. Well, what that just wiped a smile off your face. I said ARC. <laughs> Never. <laughs> ARC is this loose confederation of very, very different communities. And the Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District is a, uh, a community, is, is this loosely affiliated group that have very, very different uh, uh, public priorities and economic priorities. Um, and yet we need to have a, a rather unified response. 
to the hydrologic changes that are going to be going to be coming as a result of climate change. Are you say are you getting pushback from within the district and within the Atlanta Regional Commission area about these different activities that all of the different panelists are discussing? I wouldn't say that I get uh, any pushback. Uh, you know, we have our water resources management plan. Uh, we had that. We published it in 2017, and actually we're starting to do an update of that now. Uh, for 2022, we do five-year updates. And um, we really try to use the tools to reach out to the community. Um, we have technical coordinating committees and our basin advisory committees uh, that provide feedback on the ground uh, to tell us what actions that we're recommending that would work, that, that are a good fit. We try to have things that are scalable solutions uh, for different communities. So I, I wouldn't say um, that, at least I personally have not received a lot of pushback yet. We'll see, right, what the future holds. But um, I, I feel like, in fact, the, the Metro Water District provides an opportunity to be more of a convener and to bring people together to discuss these issues and look at them um, from different perspectives, because you're absolutely right that um, smaller jurisdictions within uh, the Metro District, you know, we have 95 cities actually in 15 counties, which I didn't mention earlier when I had less time, but you're right, they all have pr different personalities and, and different challenges. Not to, not to put more pressure on you, but we got a question uh, that is sort of tied into what you were just saying. When we're in our next drought, okay. water is less available. Are there, are there conservation partnerships conversations and partnerships happening at the watershed scale uh, that will help ensure water is equitably distributed between upstream and downstream neighbors. You have one minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I will say that uh, part of our plan includes an integrated action item where we're trying to bring water professionals, wastewater professionals, and stormwater professionals into the same room to come up with collaborative solutions for things like that. Uh, we also are consistently in contact with the Georgia Environmental Protection Division to make sure that the suggestions they have for drought action uh, resonate and make sense to our local jurisdictions to help them address those challenges as well. well thank you very much. I'm now gonna turn it back over to uh, Jill Gamble and Jill will wrap this up for us all. Yes, thank you all so much. This was fascinating. You all did a fantastic job. Thank you all for attending. Um, we uh, have been recording this webinar and so we will be posting it on our YouTube uh, channel and sharing that in a follow-up email with you all. Um, as you leave the webinar, please take a minute to um, uh, fill out the evaluation form and um, I wanna thank again our presenters and Rob as our moderator. Thank you all so much for taking the time. I know this is a busy, crazy year. We appreciate it. Um, and I hope you all have a very happy uh, holidays and new year. Uh, we will see you in 2021 with uh, some new webinars on uh, other topics. So thank you all so much. Have a happy holiday. <laughs>